So our next speaker in this session is Dr. Shalewa Noel Thomas. Um, Dr. Noel Thomas serves as the Bureau Chief for the Cancer and Chronic Disease Prevention Bureau at Washington, D.C. Department of Health here in town. And in this capacity, she oversees the Chronic Disease Division, um, Cancer Programs Division, the Cancer Registry, and the Tobacco Control Program. That's a mouthful. She has a, wears a lot of hats. Um, prior to joining DC Health, Dr. Noel Thomas served as the Director of the Office of Minority Health and Health Disparities at the Maryland Department of Health, where she directed multiple programs designed to address health disparities. And I encourage you um, to refer to your program to read more about Dr. Dr. Noel Thomas and all of our speakers in this session. There's so much I could say about each and every one of you. So um, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Noel Thomas to the podium. So good afternoon, everyone. OK, I know it's after lunch. Good afternoon, everyone. All right. Um, so thank you for that wonderful introduction, Nicole. And today I'm going to be talking about opportunities to promote effective public health cancer communications within the context of a local health department. So of course I have to get through this slide first. Um, the DC Department of Health, um, the vision of course of the department is to be the healthiest city in America. So we want Washington DC of course to be the healthiest city in the nation. And our mission at the department is to promote health, wellness and equity across the district to protect the safety of residents, to protect our visitors, and certainly those who are doing business here in our nation's capital. We do have five strategic priorities within the department that help to inform and guide the work we do, and those are to promote a culture of health and wellness, to address the social determinants of health. We also aim to strengthen public-private partnerships. We want to close the chasm between med uh, clinical medicine and public health. And we also work to implement data-driven and outcome-oriented approaches to program and policy development. So what is health literacy? I think health literacy has probably been defined all of today, but um, I'll reiterate it here. It's the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, process, and understand basic health information needed to make appropriate health decisions. So, at the department, when we think about health literacy, um, we're thinking about the populations we're serving, and we ask the question, well, what does health literacy really mean to the populations we serve? And we have really categorized health literacy into these three categories. There is health insurance benefits literacy, and then there is healthcare system literacy, and then, of course, there's health behavior literacy. So as we think about how we better serve our communities and our populations, we talk about health literacy in these three categories. So what is health insurance literacy, right? We find certainly that understanding insurance options certainly can be a challenge for some of our residents. Um, understanding what services are covered, for example, by the insurance they have is still a challenge. So we often hear questions about, well, what types of preventive care may be covered by different types of insurance? Um, is behavioral health covered? Is dental care covered? Is vision care covered? And so we, as the health department, we have to understand that these are still challenges for the residents that we're serving. Also, this difference between co-pays, deductibles, co-insurance, and premiums, even for Individuals with high health literacy, this can certainly um, present as a challenge. So certainly as we work with our populations with lower health literacy, we still have to be cognizant of the fact that there are, um, are misunderstandings around what these mean. Then we talk about health systems literacy, right? And so when we think about health systems literacy, we're thinking about the different levels of care, right? So what's the difference between self-care primary care, urgent care, emergency care, and how does the cost vary by these different types of care? And we often get questions from our residents about, well, what's the difference between urgent care and emergency care, for example? So clarifying these differences and defining what these different levels of care mean is important for the residents we serve. 
And then there's this question about how to access services, right? So this issue of prior authorization, for example, what does that mean to or residents? What does that mean to someone who has low health literacy? And then networks, right? So an in-network provider, what does that mean versus an out-of-network provider? We often get these questions. And of course, we do quite a bit of education with some of our sister agencies on defining what these mean. And then there's health behavior literacy. So traditionally, when we thought about health literacy, we would think about, OK, we want to teach people about health behaviors. Um, but certainly, as I um, mentioned before, health behavioral literacy is not the only focus. We have to understand that, especially with the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, there are so many other questions that come into play for residents, especially in terms of health insurance literacy and how to navigate the healthcare system. So at the department, as when we think about our health literacy interventions, we think about um, these different uh, levels of health literacy, right? So we think about high health literacy, moderate health literacy, and low health literacy. So when we think about high health literacy, we're thinking about populations that might be responsive to these low touch types of activities, right? And an example of a low touch activity for us would be a brochure or a brief interaction with a resident or mass media campaigns, for example, right? So there are some populations who may be responsive to seeing a bus ad that talks about the importance of breast and cervical cancer screening. But there are other populations that may not be as responsive. And so we think about these interventions as these low-touch interventions um, that are more appropriate for high health literacy populations. Moderate health literacy is the other level we think about, right? And so in this category, we're talking about health education classes, for example. So there's a little bit more intensity in terms of this type of an intervention, but it's still not at the level of a patient navigation program, for example, that would be more appropriate for or low literacy populations, right? So that takes us to the next category where we think about our low health literacy populations. We think about the fact that they may need more intensive supports, right? And an example of that would be patient navigation, for example, or the use of community health workers, or the use of home visitors to really be more intensive in terms of helping patients understand their care, how to navigate the system, how to take their medications, for example. So these are the different levels we think about as we think about the, the levels of health literacy. And this has been very um, helpful in terms of helping to inform the design of our health literacy interventions. So we've conducted some health literacy assessments and we've used mixed methods to do so. Um, we actually used a web-based survey as well as focus groups. And we deployed this with healthcare providers as well as with our local DC residents. And I just wanted to share some of what we did with these assessments. So these are some of the measures we looked at when we uh, deployed this ass assessment. We looked at consumer satisfaction, um, access to medical services. We looked at communication with physicians. And I won't read the entire thing, but these are some of the measures we wanted to look at as we conducted our assessment. And so here are some of the results. So what we found, first of all, is that residents have high levels of health insurance coverage here in the district. So we're happy that we have one of the highest health insurance coverage rates in the nation. And we found that residents talked about the fact that it was wonderful that they had several options for obtaining health insurance here within the district. Residents also reported high self-efficacy in terms of identifying a healthcare provider. So they thought they were very capable of identifying a provider for whatever their medical condition might be. We also found that participants were very active in chronic disease self-management, which I like to hear because 
within my bureau, we actually deploy several of these um, uh, uh, chronic disease self-management programs. We found that residents were also seeking care at regular intervals. So this was, um, this was a success that certainly um, we were uh, certainly delighted to hear about that and that they were engaged in informed decision-making practices. But where are the opportunities, right? So there were certainly some challenges um, that emerged from the assessment. Uh, we found that residents reported lengthy appointment and wait times. So what this means is they would call a provider to make an appointment and it would, the appointment would be three months out, for example. Okay? And so that's an opportunity um, for us at DC Health to think about how we begin um, to, to work on that particular challenge. Residents also, and also providers, also reported fragmentation of care and information. Um, you know, there's this lack of communication between providers that, or residents especially pointed out, that their providers were not necessarily communicating with, with each other appropriately. Um, and so thinking about what the opportunities are to make that communication between provi providers easier is something that um, we're, we're certainly discussing at DC Health, and I'll talk about some of the health information exchange platforms um, that we have here in the district. Then system navigation, again, difficulty navigating health insurance policies and practices for residents um, is certainly a challenge, and thinking about um, you know, the appropriate interventions such as patient navigation to help with navigation of the healthcare system um, is, is certainly the conversation that we're having at this point. And we're putting some supports in place um, in order to support these high intensity types of interventions that would help patients better navigate the healthcare system. There was some frustration with the way critical health information is conveyed, and so um, you know, patients talked about not necessarily understanding the critical health information that was um, conveyed by their provider uh, and the need for that information to be conveyed in different ways. Um, that would make it certainly easier for them to understand what was being conveyed. And then we, of course, um, this continues to be a challenge, low health literacy related to medications, right? So as we think about some of our populations that might be experiencing comorbid conditions and having to understand what medications apply to what condition, when to take them, um, medication interactions and those types of things continue to be a challenge. So I wanted to share this quote from one of our healthcare providers, and this quote is really talking about the fragmentation of how information is shared um, between providers. Um, and so this provider said, I would say the majority of my patients that have been hospitalized do not understand what happened to them. Uh, when I get the discharge summary, it has not been looked at since discharge by anyone. And I think it would be great if people utilize CRISP. So how many have heard, are familiar with CRISP? Okay, so, so, so several of you are familiar with CRISP, which, which is a health information exchange platform. Um, it is utilized to some extent here within the district, um, and so this provider is referring to that platform. Um, he also said, when I refer someone to a specialist or send them to the ER, I have to physically call people. Today I had to call a cardiologist's office to get the notes, so I think there's a huge disconnect. Um, we do have opportunities here for providers to better share information. Um, I think the question is the extent to which this is being utilized and the consistency with which that platform is being utilized um, is certainly where the challenge lies. And I think there's more work to be done um, to get our providers to consistently utilize these platforms, especially CRISP. So some of the recommendations that came out of the assessment are increase the use of technology to enhance communication across provider sectors. And again, the use of CRISP is an opportunity um, that I don't think has been fully explored. And it's something that we're looking at DC Health to figure out how we work more closely with our providers to, um, to increase the use of, of, um, of CRISP, of this platform. And then increase the use of telehealth is something that emerged from um, the assessment especially as it relates to specialty care. So we find that in some areas, um, cer certainly there's a dearth of specialty care 
um, or access to specialty care. And so thinking about how telehealth could be useful um, to increase access to that type of specialty care um, is a conversation that we're having. Um, and then increasing high touch patient assistance um, emerged as another need. So high touch, remember, would be an example would be a cancer patient navigation program. So how do we begin to scale those programs up and make them more sustainable um, within the context of the district so that patients who need the services are able to, um, to get the services they need for patient navigation? Reducing administrative barriers, again, emerges as an issue. Um, thinking about the referral processes and some of the other administrative barriers that patients sometimes do not understand. So as the Department of Health, we're thinking about how do we work across sectors uh, to be able to address some of these barriers. And then providing a single digital health management tool I thought was an important finding from the assessment, particularly among patients who wanted access to a tool where they could ask questions amongst each other, they could manage their appointments, and they could share information. There are some provider networks that certainly provide these tools, but consistency, again, is an issue. Some patients have access to these types of tools, and some don't. So I wanted to provide some specific examples of some of the health literacy interventions at the different levels um, that we provide um, at DC Health. And uh, mass media campaigns, I talked about these low intensity um, type of interventions. Um, so a bus ad, for example, um, and this bus ad is advertising or DC quit line. This ad is also advertising or DC quit line, and this was a bus stop ad. Um, kind of talking about the DC quit line and the thinking about um, how we get residents motivated who, are, who need smoking cessation services. Um, we hope that when they see these signs, they'll be motivated to call the DC quit line. Of course, we understand that not all residents who need the services who see a bus passing by with the ad would be necessarily motivated um, to utilize the service. This is another low intensity, low touch um, type of intervention here. And this is our well woman campaign. This is another bus ad. It says a well woman is a successful woman. And what we were trying to do is we were trying to get women to actually get their well woman visits on a regular basis, right? Which would include their breast and cervical cancer screenings. Another example of just a, a low touch type of intervention. And this is a flyer which um, really talks about our breast and cervical um, screening program at the department. This is our CDC funded program. And this is a flyer educating women on the services that are offered within that program. So thinking about the medium level health literacy interventions, this would be an example, right? So this is our cancer thriving and surviving evidence-based um, self-management program. Uh, which provides education, so it's a class, and we have um, cancer survivors and their caregivers attend these classes where we provide self-management education, and we also talk about issues such as how to communicate with your provider. Uh, and so this would be an example of one of those types of interventions that um, we deploy out of the department. And then here's our cancer patient navigation um, program. This is the framework that guides the program. And of course, our patient navigation is our individualized assistance that we provide to cancer patients to help to address and eliminate some of those barriers um, to timely follow-up and to um, long-term survivorship. So our patient navigate, navigators, of course, they have to go through health literacy training. So I just wanted to share that with you. And these are some pictures of our patient navigators actually going through their health literacy training. And they were very engaged in terms of really thinking about how they interact with patients, how they build trust with patients in order to navigate them across the cancer continuum. And a lot of that involves, as you all know, navigating the healthcare system and explaining to patients what it means. Um, some of those terms I talked about before, what some of those terms really mean. And then I want to close by just saying this, this is 
continues to be one of my favorite slides. Um, at the department, like I talked about before, you know, one of our strategic priorities is to ensure that we're addressing the social determinants of health because we want to advance toward health equity. And one way to do so is to meet people where, where they are. So we realize that there are different populations that need different supports. And so the little guy who's not able to see over the fence, we want to ensure that we're providing the appropriate supports for him to be able to have an opportunity at optimal health. And so I will close with that and I look forward to, to further discussion. Thank you.